A very warm welcome to Study IQ, my dear friends. I am Prashant Mavani. I hope you all are in good. Today is 13th July 2020. I would like to start today's discussion with this quote. I want you guys to think about it. I'm going to throw some points in front of you. And I want you guys to meditate on it. I want you guys to think about it. Charity is a very beautiful thing. But charity is injurious unless it helps the recipient to become independent of it. I find so many people, right, beggars particularly, they are healthy, they are tip-top. But then as well they are begging. Why? Because they are prisoners. They are, uh, you know, prisoners of this cage of charity. They are so lazy that they don't want to do anything and they just want to uh, scavenge all these freebies that they get. Uh, and you will find them outside a very, you know, they are very strategic as well. They will uh, sit outside, uh, outside this um, hospitals or temples or mosques uh, and they will uh, find their meal at uh, Gurudwara's langas or uh, some other langas or this uh, free food that we find in various different uh, uh, religious places. So it's a good thing, charity is a good thing, but uh, this is getting more organized now. You know, there are so many scavengers uh, these days and we have to be very careful about it. The other thing is, and this is not just about our country. Uh, if you find this thing in various different, uh, various different uh, developing nations, uh, freebies, you know, political parties or governments coming out with freebies or uh, those sort of schemes uh, that will give uh, free laptops, a free cycle, a free petrol in some Gulf countries. So all these things are also directly, indirectly making you a slave of this uh, freebies, right? So think about it. With this, dear friends, Study IQ team has designed a smart course. Uh, this uh, smart course is for civil services examination. To find out more about it, download our mobile application. To download the PDF of today's lecture, check out my Telegram channel. You can follow me on Facebook as well. Please make sure that you share this lecture with other students. Uh, hit the like button if you have learned something from today's discussion. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have already subscribed, then can I request you guys to ask three more friends or family members to subscribe our YouTube channel. Now, dear friends, on our table, we have seven important uh, articles. Uh, I will take you through it directly now. So let's quickly start with Malabar moment. Malabar exercise. It's an annual exercise, a naval exercise to be precise, conducted by India. It started with India and USA. Uh, in 2015, Japan was also taken on board on this Malabar exercise. And now this Malabar exercise is in news or part of current affairs because Australia is going to be a new member. Uh, for a very long period of time, India was, uh, you know, that India was not ready. India was uh, hesitating in taking Australia on board of this Malabar exercise. But now uh, it is reported that uh, India is okay with uh, Australia becoming part of or taking part in this Malabar exercise. Again, it's an annual naval exercise. Uh, the reason why Australia is important is because on your screen, you can see Indian Ocean. Now, of course, India has a very strategic location when it comes to Indian Ocean. Australia is also part of Indian Ocean, littoral state. That means it is sharing its uh, boundary with this water body called Indian Ocean. Now, we all know, dear friends, and we have talked about it early on as well, but uh, still for uh, new students, uh, I would like to say that China is a country that is increasing its presence in Indian Ocean. Now, China, as you can see on your screen, is not a littoral state of Indian Ocean, but then as well, we find China expanding its uh, horizon in uh, uh, Indian Ocean. Like, for example, you have this uh, country called Djibouti here in Horn of Africa. So this is uh, China's, uh, Djibouti is China's first military base. So this is, uh, as you can see, Arabian Sea from here. Let me throw some more light. This is called Gulf of Aden. And from Gulf of Aden, if you reach here, you will find a tiny place, a tiny sort of waterway is called Bab al Mandeb. From Bab al Mandeb, you can enter or exit the Red Sea. And from Red Sea, you can enter or exit uh, using Suez Canal, Mediterranean Sea. So very important uh, for China's relationship with uh, European nations. Uh, we are going to talk about it as well later on. And uh, it is a very strategic location. 
then you have this uh, Strait of Hormuz. And now this is a matter of concern for our country as well because we have good relationship with Iran. Now China, it is said that China is going to build a strategic port on this Hormuz Strait. Hormuz Strait is very important. It is important for exit and entry uh, to and from uh, Persian Gulf. Right, this is Persian Gulf here, and uh, this is uh, Gulf of Oman. And to, to enter or exit uh, this uh, uh, Persian Gulf, uh, you have to use this uh, strait called Hormuz. So China is going to build a port here. Then Karachi and Gwadar are already de facto naval facilities. So China is expanding its uh, horizon here in Indian Ocean. So it is very important that like-minded nations uh, together counter China. We have to ensure that Indian Ocean remains uh, free. Uh, every country follows uh, rules and regulations, uh, international unclosed rules and regulations here in Indian Ocean. We don't want to see any troubles here in Indian Ocean. We don't want to see uh, naval issues uh, taking place here. For that, uh, increasing security is important. And for that, uh, Australia uh, coming on board is also important. For a very long period of time, uh, uh, for a very long period of time, India was not that ready for change, and because of uh, this, uh, you can say I would say lethargy of India. Um, you know, we were not uh, that uh, open, or uh, we were not that flexible, uh, and uh, this was uh, our weakness. And China has, uh, uh, we have to talk about uh, you know reality that China is uh, quite flexible. China is very fast in de taking decisions. So this was uh, their advantage or it has been China's advantage and uh, this uh, lethargy has been our disadvantage. Back in 2007 to save money and uh, you know it's much easier if you have if you are going to do a bilateral exercise with Japan, Australia, Singapore, USA uh, every year then how about bringing all of them on board and doing one single big exercise. So that's what India did back in 2007. But China was not happy with this thing. China objected this uh, exercise that was conducted in Bay of Bengal and China called it uh, Asian NATO as well. So left parties in our country, they were not happy with this decision and they came out on street and there was too much pressure on then Defense Minister A.K. Anthony. And uh, A.K. Anthony was so furious that he plugged the plug. I beg your pardon, he pulled the plug on any multilateral naval exercises and he also created, uh, you know, uh, full stops uh, for uh, political as well as bureaucratic, uh, uh, you know, uh, setup that can that can create uh, some big exercises. So all the work that was uh, done by Manmohan Singh Ji as well as Pranam Mukherjee uh, since uh, 2005 was uh, literally destroyed uh, uh, by the decision of then uh, Defense Minister A K Anthony. Then came in 2014 uh, Modi government, and uh, since then we have seen that. Uh, uh, this sort of uh, defense relationship, uh, they are uh, they are given necessary importance, and ball is in. We can see that uh, this this wheel is in motion now, so it's good that Australia is on board. Moving on to next item, which is very important for economy, very important for our country because uh, it is associated with agriculture. Quickly, a uh, fifty percent plus population in our country is associated with agriculture. Uh, when agricultural economy goes up, when they make money, when farmers make money, that means uh, rural India makes money, villages make money. When they have money, they will buy things made by urban factories. Uh, so this will impact uh, or this will create a positive uh, virtuous cycle for our whole economy. The good thing is that uh, farmers have completed sowing of uh, kharif crops. So kharif crops are crops associated with monsoon. So if you see the sowing season till the first week of July, then we have seen that nearly 55% is, uh, you know, 55% area is, is under this uh, Kharif uh, sowing till the first week of July. That's a good news because last year it was just 38%. So a big jump here. So more production, more production means more money, more money means... As I told you, right, it will impact our all. It will create a virtuous cycle for our whole economy because uh, things are not going that well because of this pandemic and lockdown and things like that. The reason behind this uh, expansion in uh, Kharif uh, sowing area is because 
Good monsoon. Southwest monsoon so far has been on time and so far 14% above normal rains uh, took place in our country. That's a good thing. 146% of the last 10 years average has been achieved in major reservoirs and uh, groundwater tables have recharged as well. So farmers have sought to capitalize on the excellent soil moisture conditions. In our country, 60% agricultural land, even today, is directly rain-fed. Rain so, it is dependent on rain. So, so far, things are in favor of farmers as well as agriculture. Sales of uh, fertilizers have gone up as well. And here you can see some list of uh, kharif crops. Uh, you need to remember this. And uh, the trick is to revise them again and again, to observe them. It's not just... In your books, but when you travel on highways, uh, right? When you see some, uh, some, some agricultural land, then inquire about it, right? If you can have a discussion with farmer friends, or if you are from farming family, then you'd be aware about it. But if you are not, then you can have a word with uh, uh, farmers, uh, right? Uh, make them your gurus and learn a few things uh, from farmers, like uh, how to identify crops and which are the crops that you find in winter time. In, uh, in summertime, in monsoon time. So these are the things. You will find these sort of questions. And this is very important. If you want to join civil services, then you should know a few things. I'm not saying you should be a farmer. What I'm saying is you should have basic understanding about, you should be able to know the major crops like kharif and rabi, etc. Okay. Now, dear friends, uh, there are a few challenges as well. Uh, See, monsoon is getting more and more erratic because of this climate change. So the second inning, August to September, will define the final outcome. If things are as it is now, then that's a good thing. If they turn around or if, if they change altogether, then that's going to be a big problem. Last year, there was a very little rainfall in the last week of July, after which it poured so much in 2019 that 2019 was recognized as... Uh, one of the wettest year in uh, the quarter of century in the last 25 years. If you see, then uh, July is, uh, not July, sorry, 2019 is one of the wettest year. But this sort of wettest year is of no good because in a very short period of time, if you, if, if you have a very heavy rainfall, then that is also destructive for agriculture. So we need a well-balanced uh, rainfall. So far, that's what we have got. Now let's hope that uh, August, September, August to September period will get the same. Then we have this uh, threat of locust attack, uh, uh, food and agricultural organization. Can you give me the name of uh, uh, the parent organization of this uh, FAO? Stick your answer in the comment section. Now, FAO has warned that uh, breeding uh, is going to take place uh, along this India-Pakistan border, particularly in Rajasthan. So that's a big threat. We have to uh, you know, prepare our teams and we have to destroy this locust as quickly as possible. Moving on to next one, the Dharavi project. This one is coming from Pioneer. Uh, it's a newspaper, of course. Now, there are so many things that we can learn from Dharavi. And not just us, the whole world can learn from Dharavi. Dharavi is, uh, you know, is a very populated uh, place in Mumbai. Uh, it is Asia's uh, largest slum. And it has a population density of 2.27 lakh per square kilometer. Population of Dharavi is 6.5 lakh uh, residents uh, and uh, uh, they are living in an area that is just 2.5 uh, square kilometers. So you can imagine how dense uh, this Dharavi is and all those things that are necessary to control COVID-19 like uh, social distancing, frequent hand washing, uh, living in well ventilated spaces, this is not possible in Dharavi. You find 10 uh, people living in a 100 uh, square feet area, so that is uh, too much congestion, right? It's not an atmosphere, it's congestion for sure. So, and one more thing, 80% of sl uh, slum dwellers are forced to use community toilets. So, Western papers were right in their projection that uh, Dharavi is or it could be a ticking COVID bomb. Anytime COVID-19 will hit, coronavirus will hit Dharavi and things will be out of control. But Dharavi is, uh, you know, it's a very interesting place here. You can see Dharavi has defeated or controlled COVID-19. 
and this is possible because of a synchronized human drill what they have done is exceptional and this dharavi is uh, you know is a lighthouse for all those countries resource deprived zones or nations they can learn so many things from dharavi what they did is bmc bmc created few teams this teams educated families right uh, and this families educated individuals so they created this whole chain they first of all they created awareness about covid 19 and things that we can do and things we should not do and things like that you know do's and don'ts so it was more like a quick education program then testing was very aggressive from 1st april to uh, july 10th july uh, 2020 they have uh, tested uh, some they have scanned some 47500 households so if you say multiply it by 5 then we are talking about 2 lakh 50000 people Uh, right were uh, scanned by doctors and private clinics private clinics were taken on board we'll talk about that point as well and as you can see on your screen like 48246 senior citizens were surveyed and they were quarantined and if and they they this uh, dharavi means this team of bmc what they did uh, they they used a very unique method they they started uh, scaling people's uh, oxygen saturation level so if it was below 95 then they were quarantined if they were above 95 then things were okay so rather than relying too much on other tests uh, this oxygen saturation level will give you a very quick test if you are having a bit bit of fever or something then you have to quarantine yourself if you don't have that facility then local clubs and schools were converted into quarantine facilities you can go there uh, private hospitals were taken on board uh, community played a very important role and politicians right all stakeholders like politicians ngos bollywood actors big businessmen they donated gear oxygen cylinders gloves mask medicine ventilators those people who were not able to give money or this sort of support material support uh, they uh, gave social hours like they were there uh, in the field and they were helping people so dharavi has proved one thing that human endeavor is the biggest cure that's what i can say with this difference on your screen you can see one person his name is uh, julio uh, ribero he's known as super cop uh, he uh, has worked as dgp of uh, gujarat dgp of punjab and uh, you know he was a police commissioner of uh, mumbai and uh, i have read his book called uh, bullet to bullet uh, bullet for bullet uh, that's his autobiography very interesting book if you are if you are if you are thinking or planning to join police services then this is a book that is very important it's like a bible for you guys you know it will tell you so many things about uh, police life and what are the good things and bad things and so many interesting stories as well you'll find in this a book bullet for bullet so make sure if you are inclined to join a uniform service like police service then make sure you read this book by Julio Ribeiro now he is writing this article he said that when he joined uh, police services back in 1953 uh, at that point of time criminals were uh, criminals like uh, vikas dubey india was not a factory of creating this sort of uh, criminals because Uh, gundas were there uh, you know the dakus were there at that point of time but they were afraid of police and there was you know they used to respect police as well they were not like uh, police was not in their police services so this whole police uh, system was not in their pockets at that point of time at present unfortunately you know how things are there isn't it now the most important thing about police service is that it's not a force anymore it was a force when it was uh, under this british uh, rule but now we are living under our constitution so it should be a service but unfortunately we are still treated like we are subject and it's not just the police personnel the whole system the law their books everything is about controlling rather than providing a good pleasant experience and service because when you are in trouble right uh, police is the first friend that you will call right if you meet unfortunately an accident or maybe someone is creating trouble or threatening you or whatever it is right if something related with criminality then you will give a call to police but uh, investigation is not up to the mark uh, politics too much of politics and you know it very well so i'm not going into too much details but police is the first person or first department of government uh, prosecutors defense uh, lawyers and judges all these things uh, they come later on 
Many a times we find that FIRs are not taken. Even if FIRs are taken, then it all depends on SHO and investigation officer. Uh, we need to create, uh, we need to find the best talent, uh, right, when it comes to investigation, right? There are people who are very, you know, they have this natural knack as well as you can train them uh, for attention to details. And these are the people we need uh, for investigation. There are people who are good in law and order. So we need to create these two different departments, but still this is, I don't know when uh, we will get this thing. Uh, it is also said that once we clean police uh, services, if if we can have a very robust and very, uh, citizen-centric uh, police services then uh, we can change so many we can with the whole experience our whole society uh, will get uplifted but uh, there are politicians they like to control it and uh, because of their nexus it all started he is talking about 1980s back in 1980s this whole you know we, we were talking about this thing few days ago as well that you have this triangle where uh, you will have a politician on one side, then you will have uh, police on one side, and then you will have criminals. So if they are working with each other, if they have an access, then nothing can stop them. And that's what has happened, and that's what uh, is going on in our country. I'm not saying each and every police personnel is bad. Please don't take it that way. There are so many patriotic and citizen-centric uh, uh, police personnel, right? I think most of them are like that uh, but unfortunately we have few corrupted people and uh, people who are not fit for being a police officer they don't have that temperament they don't have that uh, pressure handling skill and the examination and there are so many things that are not right so we need to change it you know uh, there was a time when julio ribeiro in his book as well he is saying that uh, if some sort of a case is going on then a politician will never interfere uh, with uh, police investigation but nowadays you know that even in petty matters uh, you will get calls from local uh, politicians uh, to do and not to do what to do and what not to do and things like that. if you don't follow them then they will contact their high commands and then you will see a transfer and things like that so this is like a motor uh, you know it's like a business uh, they have turned it into a business which is very unfortunate and when you are living in this sort of uh, triangle then you will definitely find more and more people like Vikas Dubey Moving on to next item, sure power. This one is about Prime Minister Narendra Modi's uh, speech he delivered at uh, Reva in Madhya Pradesh uh, whilst he inaugurated the 750 megawatt photovoltaic project. Of course, if we create more solar energy, if solar energy can become the main source of energy uh, for our economy as well as our individual everyday life, then we will become free. All right? At present, we are dependent on Gulf nations for power. When I say power, I mean to say this uh, fuel or energy, basically, right? We import some 80 to 85 percent of fuel from them, and that's how our transportation and everything works on that thing. India's uh, present uh, installed uh, capacity is uh, 35 gigawatt, which is uh, not enough because by 2022, when it comes to solar power, our target is 100 gigawatt and the way things are going on with China, right, 95% of items, uh, polysilicon and this uh, other things that we need, uh, we are buying from China and now we are going to stop buying these things. So it's not like if we stop buying things, then it is going to be a big boost uh, for our manufacturing. We have to create that sort of policy. That's what China did. China started supporting uh, manufacturing back in 1990s and uh, you know it gave money and other sort of hand holding thing was given so if we don't do the same thing we are not going to means this uh, boycott china is going to hurt us rather than uh, create opportunities in our country uh, we have to be very creative here as well just manufacturing is not enough r and d uh, sh uh, you know we need to do lots and lots of r and d as well research and development like uh, thinking out of the box, uh, for example, how about creating a paint that uh, we can uh, paint our houses and that uh, sort of paint will be having s those sort of things in it that can create uh, energy that can grab the solar energy and convert it into electricity. What about uh, if we are clearing agricultural land and then we are using the solar park, how about creating the solar parks uh, uh, on roads can we design those sort of uh, plates or uh, this uh, what do we say panels uh, that we can or a, a sort of paint that we can apply on our highways and then this highways will produce electricity so there are so many things that we can we have to think out of the box on your screen you can see european union's high representative for foreign affairs and security policy his name, name is uh, joseph borel fontelas 
and uh, he said that china is without doubt one of the key global player we have to engage with china to achieve our global objectives based on interests and values so it looks like after covid-19 as well european union as well as china's relationship is going to be as strong as it used to be but there are few red flags as well like china's efforts to cultivate a separate uh, european subconstituencies like 16 plus 1 format and uh, china and russia doing a joint exercise uh, in the uh, baltic sea uh, cross sectoral hybrid threats including information operations in european countries uh, china's behavior in south china sea in indian ocean and then china acquiring or building this key ports like uh, one in uh, greece so all these things are red flags uh, for uh, so many european nations uh, when it comes to germany germany is a powerhouse or economic powerhouse for europe and uh, it is uh, you know germany is having a very good relationship with a trade relationship with china uh, the latest uh, report that was released uh, strategic outlook and in this report uh, ursula von der uh, leyen uh, she is uh, uh, european commission's uh, president and uh, she has said that uh, relationship with china are important but at the same time they are most challenging as well because uh, european union is observing what china is doing in Uh, china is doing with uh, india at lse uh, european union knows this thing that what china is doing in uh, with hong kong or uh, with uh, other nations right it's misbehavior and i think uh, see usa and uh, european union they used to have very good relationship but too much of aggression from mr trump has created a sort of vacuum and this vacuum is uh, filled by china so european means usa has to do its job at the same time few days ago remember we were talking about vietnam and uh, european union that uh, recently they had this uh, eu as well as uh, vietnam they had this free trade agreement we are negotiating this free trade agreement for a very long period of time so this is the time that we have to create we have to do some radical changes um we can create good relationship means we have good relationship with uh, european nations but now is the time to upgrade it to next level right uh, they want more trade they want more business more profits for that we need to create this uh, free trade agreement with them uh, you know th- there are so many european nations they want to shift their base uh, out of china so this is the time that uh, we can attract and have a word with them so very important uh, article and a point of view then uh, last one is about a museum to mosque on your screen you can see this uh, place this is known as hagia sophia where do you find this place istanbul right uh, turkey turkey's capital is ankara and uh, here you find this city called istanbul very important as you if you observe the map of turkey then you will find this is europe this is middle east So Turkey is a place where you'll find a perfect blend of uh, European life as well as uh, the modern uh, more forward uh, sort of uh, European life as well as that traditional uh, Middle East or traditional West Asian life right so here you find muslim girls and muslim boys right they are more you know with fashion and things if you see turkish girls particularly then you I want to believe they are coming from a muslim country because you know that uh, other muslim countries they have a very traditional they wear burkas and hijabs and things but here the girls are uh, means they 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 carry makeup and everything so i know this thing because i used to study with uh, means in, when i used to do masters then we used to have so many uh, turkish uh, girls uh, right and we used to talk about their culture and things so i know this thing that uh, they have uh, they have they live a very modern life uh, you know in turkey most of them because uh, that's how their history has been now this place here this uh, this turkey and the reason i'm saying they have modern life is because uh, it is important without that thing without this thing you won't understand what turkey is all about particularly istanbul it was known as uh, alion the name was constantinople but now it is known as istanbul so the president uh, of uh, turkey erdogan Uh, he has decided that he is going to convert this museum into a mosque earlier on if you go back in the history then you find that it was built by uh, byzantine emperor uh, justinian 1 and it was a cathedral like a church 
and then uh, Mehmed the Conqueror, he captured the city in 1453, since then it was converted into a mosque, and then later on uh, the country was liberated by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Uh, you will find his name when you read uh, Khalifat uh, moment in our country. So it was associated with uh, this uh, uh, Khalifa who used to live in Istanbul and uh, you know it was a big chair this Istanbul or this Turkey uh, so um, anyway not going into too much details of course when you'll read uh, uh, Khilafat movement not Khalifa sorry Khilafat movement in our country then you will find uh, things associated with Mustafa Kemal Ataturk so he liberated this uh, nation he, he is basically known as Ataturk means uh, father of Turkey Right or Turkey people, uh, so Ataturk is father of Turkey. That's what Ataturk means. So in 1930 he created a new Turkey that was secular, and uh, Turkey became an example of uh, Christian and Muslim coexistence. Because if you go back in their history, then you find there are so many, uh, you know, wars took place uh, here in Istanbul and areas over here. So it was all Christian versus Muslim. But uh, it all changed with uh, this new country called Turkey uh, that was crea created by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. And uh, now what we find here is uh, Erdogan is trying to destroy the secular nature of Turkey. And uh, Erdogan is trying to do all these things is because he wants to attract uh, people's attention towards him. His party lost uh, local elections in Istanbul and Ankara. Uh, Economy-wise, Turkey is not doing that great, and uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19 as well, it is uh, spreading like wildfire in Turkey. So he's basically trying to draw people. At, he's trying to distract people from all these bad things, and he's trying to, uh, you know, impress all those people who are who are uh, you know who are like hardcores or you can say those uh, radicals or those people who want to make uh, who wants to destroy the secular nature of. Turkey. And that's basically everything in today's uh, discussion, dear friends. We have talked about seven important articles, isn't it? Seven different topics uh, in, what, uh, 33 minutes. So, these are some news items on your screen. There are, of course, some more news. Uh, so, I want you guys to go through various different newspapers. Uh, whichever newspaper you like, go through the news items. And that's everything from my side. I will see you with daily financial news analysis. Till then, enjoy your studies. God bless you all. Jai Hind.